Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. God bless you. How is everybody? I hope everybody is doing okay. Can you hear me? Tell me if my sound is loud and clear. Give me one in the text if you can hear me. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. So the sound seems okay. Thanks to the Lord. Welcome everybody. I hope you are having a wonderful time. Today we wanted to, to uh, do another live show. And uh, I think today's topic is going to be very important. Uh, like my last live show. Because we are going to destroy many historical claims of Muslims and Islam. You know, Muslims, you really can't trust any Muslim, to be honest with you. If you do some research like I do about many historical claims done by Muslims, you'll be shocked how many lies and deceptions there is. People already know that, but, you know, many things, many topics are unfortunately not discussed enough. So today we're going to do a nice change about it. Now, before we start, guys, before we start, I want to say to everybody, thank you for joining in. Share the link of today's live show with your friends and on social media. And I want to say, it's showtime. I mean, hey, guys, guys, guys. David Wood always says TikTok. So from now on, I will use it's showtime, okay? So. It sounds fair, right, guys? Come on. I mean, come on. Come on. I mean, uh, uh, that's what he said. <laughs> okay, guys. Last time, guys, last time we were mentioned <clears throat> the many different Quranic versions, right? And as you see here in the background, uh, J. Smith, our dear brother, J. Smith and... Our sister Hatun Tash have collected many Qur'ans during the last years. And they went on Speaker's Corner, which is in London. And as you see, they put all these Qur'ans in the faces of the Muslims. And Muslims went crazy. They wanted even to steal the Qur'ans from them. And... At that time, it was only 26, but the numbers are growing and we are finding more and more different Qur'ans. Different Qur'ans, guys. So if you didn't watch yesterday's video, let me do a small introduction, then we will move to the uh, historical part. But before we start, guys, before we start, let us pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we will be guided and... Lord willing, we will speak without any error. So pray with me in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, please, Lord, guide us so we can learn to forgive others who might curse us or persecute us because we are followers of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your Holy Son, O Father. Lord, give me today the strength and also when I'm weak and in need of your comfort to do another amazing live show with our dear friends and family in Christ in the live chat and everybody who is watching. Please, Lord, give us a measure of your strength so that we might not give into discouragement, deception, taqiyya, or any doubt. Please, Lord, please help us honor you in all our ways. Lord, thank you that when I'm weak, you are very strong. The devil is scheming, and I know he desires to keep us from spending time with you, Lord. Lord, thank you for your grace, and because of the ultimate sacrifice of your beloved Son, we are saved. Please give me the courage and wisdom to speak without any error, God. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit to overcome lies and deception. Help me not to lean on my own understanding, but in everything acknowledge you 
so that you can direct my words, thoughts, and actions. Please, Lord, give me the courage to do whatever needs to be done for the truth. And only the truth can set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On this live broadcast, guys, on this live broadcast, we will have the opportunity to expose the historical claims of Muhammad and Islam. But like I said, we will do a nice small introduction about last time's uh, live show, my last live show. And then from then on, we will continue about today's topic. Last but not least, guys, when I finish my today's teaching, we will have a nice Q&A session like always with our guests in the live chat. And hopefully we will have also a Muslim who has the courage and the knowledge to call us live on Skype and try to refute me. So in other words, you can ask me questions about today's teaching and I will try to answer as far as I can. My Skype ID, if the admins uh, wants to put it in the live chat, my Skype ID is the Rob Christian. So let us start, guys. Guys, please don't forget to also mention our great admins in your prayers. Also, pray for me. I need your prayers to keep us healthy, guys, so we can continue doing our work for the Lord, right? Nothing is important in life than the truth. This is why we are keep doing what we do. I've received a lot of insults, guys. I've received a lot of insults because of my la latest live show about, as you see, the Quranic, the many Quranic versions. Uh, I don't want to show you on screen, but uh, very horrible, horrible insults I've received. So. I think we are doing an amazing job. I mean, imagine if I get messages from, from Muslims who will say, Rob Christian, you're doing an amazing job, Rob Christian. Keep doing that. So it seems that we are hitting some uh, very sensitive notes, guys. We are, I think we are doing a good job. Else, why would I not get insults from Muslims, right? So we are, we are getting there, guys. And Muslims, let me tell you a little secret. The more you insult me, the more you insult my family, I get motivated to spank your fake prophet and expose your filthy satanic code called Islam. So keep insulting me because for me it's a blessing, it's a motivation to keep doing what we do. So about yesterday's teaching, like I mentioned, the many different Quranic versions that we discussed and we showed you in the last live show that even Ubay ibn Kab, guys, uh, the Hafs version, the Hafs version that the majority countries, especially Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and many other countries, it's uh, by, from the recitation of Hafs. So they don't have the actual Quran of Muhammad. They don't have the actual Quran of Uthman. So it's lost. The Quran of Muhammad is gone. The Quran of Uthman is gone. So they have the recitation of Hafs. And we know that Hafs was a liar and a deceiver, right? He was a liar and a deceiver. And not only that, he was also a thief. He used to steal books and say, these are mines. So he, he said, I wrote these books, but he was a liar. It was not their, his own books. And he never gave them back to their real owners. So that's the Hafs recitation that they call the Quran. There is no real Quran anymore, guys. It's only a recitation from a guy that lived 200 years after Muhammad. So, so we showed you last time that Ubay ibn Kaab, who is one of the four that was mentioned by Muhammad, he was having a discussion, and this is a Sahih Hadith mentioned everywhere. You see how many sources? And this is a, according to this, um, Sheikh Muhammad Salah al Munajjid, this is from IslamQA.info, guys, very trustful source. And Sheikh, it is a Sahih Isnad. So everything that you see here is Sahih. So there's a discussion between Ubay ibn Kaab, who is one of the most trusted 
companions of Muhammad with another Sahabi, with another companion, saying, asking him, I said to him, how many verses are in Surah Al-Ahzab, right? Which is chapter, I believe, 33 from the Quran. He says it contains 73 verses. So Ubayy, Ubayy bin Kaab says, only, only 73? And look what his reaction is. There was a time when it was long as Surah Al-Baqarah, and we read in it, the old man, the old woman, if they commit zina, then stone them both. A punishment from Allah, and Allah is almighty, not most wise. So according to this, uh, to Ubayy bin Kaab, Surah Al-Ahzab, is today only 73 verses but back then it used to be as big as surat al-baqarah which is the chapter of the cow let me show you guys what i'm trying to say this is surat al-baqarah guys this is surat al-baqarah look how many verses there it's very big chapter and this is the biggest chapter as you see it has 286 ayahs, verses, right? But Surah Al-Ahzab today has only 73. This is Surah Al-Ahzab. You see? So if we do a nice calculation, guys, if we do a nice calculation, we get 213 ayahs are missing from chapter 33 of the Quran. Imagine, according to Ubay ibn Kaab, and he's one of the four that Muhammad said to go to, right? 213 ayahs are missing from the Quran, guys. Oh boy, oh boy, yes, you heard it correctly. These are not my words, right? These are the words of Ubay ibn Kaab. He says it was as long Surah Al-Ahzab was as long as Surah Al-Baqarah. Did you catch it? Yes, 213 verses, ayahs, are missing from the Quran. It's a miracle. Where is CP when we need him to call Zakir Naik to ask him about this? Muslims, according to one of the biggest Sahabas of Muhammad, More than half of chapter 33 is missing. It's gone. It's lost. Oh, oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, Marjana, maybe the goat of Aisha ate it. Now, Muslims say, Muslims say, the Quran have been memorized by Muslims for the last 1400 years by heart. Now, question. Are you telling me that the goat of Aisha or the sheep of Aisha went inside the hearts of these Muslims, these Sahaba, these companions, to eat them from their hearts, not only from the paper of Aisha under her pillow? Remember the hadith of, about the sheep of Aisha, right guys? How the sheep of Aisha ate the two verses, the stoning of zina, right? So this Abay is saying zina means fornication or adultery, right? So the ayah of fornication or adultery used to be in Surah Al-Ahzab, in chapter 33, guys. So we know where this verse that it, Aisha is talking about, where it was. It was in Surah Al-Ahzab, according to Ubayy ibn Kaab. Did you catch it? So we know where it was, but it's gone. It's not in Surah Al-Ahzab anymore. It's gone, it's missing. Right? Muslims, I will give you $1,000 if you can show me the ayah of stoning people who commit fornication or adultery. I'll give you $1,000 if you can show me from this chapter the ayah of stoning someone who commits adultery in Islam. Sounds a fair challenge, right guys? So, let us continue. And this is the uh, hadith that I mentioned, right guys? The verse of stoning and of adult breastfeeding 10 times was revealed, right? And the tame sheep of Aisha came in and ate them. 
So it became a very holy sheep, and this same sheep went in the hearts of the believers, and not only did it eat the, the, the paper, it ate also the ayahs from the hearts of the companions. Imagine what kind of magical sheep this must be, man. Oof, 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 Christian Prince. Oof, oof, oof. Surat al-Rajim, yeah. The, sorry, the eyes of a rajim, of stoning people who commit fornication or adultery, right? This sheep is so powerful, guys, that it went inside the hearts of the believers to eat the eyes from there. So maybe we, this same sheep ate the 213 missing eyes. Who knows? Allahu alam, right? Allahu alam. Really a mighty, this sheep is much more mightier than Allah himself because Allah cannot stop the sheep from eating the ayahs of his Quran. I mean, Allah, do something about the sheep, man. This sheep is crazy. It's going crazy. Uh, I think the sheep, guys, became Islam's most wanted sheep. The Muslims are still looking for the sheep. Maybe the sheep is hiding somewhere, right? So if you can find the sheep, call Zakir Naik, right? Call Zakir Naik. Anyway, and not only that, we also mentioned in our last live show that the number one guy, Mr. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, in his version of the Quran, there were three surahs missing so he didn't include the three prayers guys let me explain what is happening here ibn mas'ud is another guy who is one of the four like ubay ibn kab he's the number one guy he didn't include chapter one that you see here in front of you to his quran why because it's a prayer right allah is praying here allah is saying allah is saying allah guide us to the straight path so Allah is asking Allah to guide him to the straight path. Allah is saying, it's you who we worship and you, we ask for help. So Allah is asking Allah, that doesn't make sense. So this guy was too smart to not include Surah 1, Surah 13, Surah 113. He also didn't include this one. You see, this is also a prayer. And this one also, the last one is also a prayer. You see that? So according to Ibn Mas'ud, guys, let me go back. According to this guy, those three surahs that we just mentioned should not have been in the Quran in the first place. So to sum it up, Uthman's Quran that is gone, Uthman, Uthman's Quran that Muslims say that that's the Quran of today is only 114 chapters, right? Our base Quran has 116 chapters and Ibn Mas'ud has 111 chapters only. Did you catch it? So Muslims, is it 114? Is it 116? Because our base uh, Ubay Ibn Kaab, he has these two surahs also included. These are also prayers. So our babe in Kaab, the guy that we mentioned here, he included these two in his Quran. So he has 116. So he included all the prayers, right? These are all prayers. Prayer number one, prayer number two, prayer number three, four and five, right? So Ibn Mas'ud removed those prayers. Did you catch it? Did you catch it, guys? Are you with me? Do you understand what is happening here? This is really devastating material, guys. So in summary, these synoptic Qur'ans had the following differences. Different numbers of surahs, like we mentioned. Is it 111? Is it 114 or 116? Surahs were also were arranged differently, guys, because Chapter 1 is not the first chapter. If we ask Muslims, what is the first chapter? They say, this is not 
This is not the real first chapter because the real first chapter starts with Iqra, read, right? When Jibreel came to so called to Muhammad, he said, read. Those, that, that is the first chapter, right? Read. So this is actually not the real first chapter. <laughs> Lord have mercy. And different words for the same verse. And we showed you the last time that there are many different meanings in the same verses. We showed you guys, we showed you that from the same verse, as you see in front of you guys, this is for example, chapter 57, ayah 24, from the Hafs version, the most used version in the world, in the Islamic world, here you have a word, it says huwa, Allah huwa al ghaniyu, right? Allah is the rich, rich guy, right? Allah is the rich one, right? He is, Allah is the rich. Here, this word that is circled here, you see that? It's missing from the Qalun and Warsh versions. So we have here one version, two versions, three versions mentioned. And these two agree with one another, but they disagree with the Havs version. This is the same Havs guys that we said that he's a liar and deceiver and a thief. Yo, what's up? Welcome guys. Welcome for the people who just joined. God bless. So this word, guys, is missing from here. Do you see it? So, but Muslims always told us, not one dot has been changed from the Quran. Not one letter is changed. But here, there's a complete word missing. Guys, wake up. So Muslims, why did you lie to us? Why are you such liars and deceivers? Have you no shame? Shame on you, Muslims, for lying to us. Who is missing, right, guys? Do you see it? This is not one, this is not the only problem. There are many examples like this, and we mentioned that in our last live show. So if you missed our life, our last live show, we discussed many other things, right? And here's another example to, you know, just to wrap it up. Here's another example. Chapter 66, Ayah 12, right? So, because some Muslims will say, oh, this is only a minor thing. No, 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 no. Habibi, no, 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 no. No, no, no. To who are you lying? To Rob Christian? Here is an example where the Aqeedah, Muslims call it Aqeedah, where the doctrine, the doctrine is totally different. For example, uh, let's say, God forbid, we find a gospel that says Jesus is not cru crucified. But we find another gospel where it says Jesus is crucified. So basically that's what happened here, right? This, that's what happened here because in this ayah, the doctrine, the aqeedah is different. Why? Here is why. In this ayah it says, وَكُتُوبِهِ Whose books? The books of Allah. The Quran, for example, the Injil, the gospel, right? The Torah and the Psalms, which they call uh, as zabur Right? So here it's talking about all the books of Allah. So, but in the same ayah from the Qalun and Warsh versions, they disagree with the Hafs version. Same ayah, guys, right? 12, 12, you see that? Chapter 66, ayah 12, ayah 12. Different versions. Again, here it says, وَكِتَابِهِ, his book. Wait a second. Are you talking here about the Quran? Are you talking here about the gospel? Are you talking here about the Torah? Or maybe the Psalms? Which one is it, Muslims? Which one is it? So here we have not only difference in meaning, because here this is about many books of Allah. Here it's only about one book. So the doctrine here is changed. The meaning is changed. Al Aqeedah, the Aqeedah. Because Muslims cannot say, hey, Rob Christian, the meaning, no, it's the same. No, no, it's not the same. Don't lie. Because here we have a difference in Aqeedah, difference in doctrine. Boom on your forehead, Muslims. Stop lying to us. Shame on you for lying for the last 1400 years. Right? 
You have been lying to us, to yourselves. Your imams have been lying to us for the last 1400 years. All right. What a shame. So guys, that was basically a, a small summary. Well, it was not really small, but that was a summary <laughs> about our last live show. So let us start about the historical evidence that have been hide to us, right? Muslims have lied a lot about his historical proofs and evidence. Someone in the text asked me to go, uh, I can't remember who that was, I think it was a lady, it was Mina. She asked in the text before I started the live show to also mention the pre-Islamic uh, story about Muhammad. I didn't want to include this, but yeah, it's not bad to do a nice introduction about the life of Muhammad before he became a so-called prophet, right? So this is from I, narrated from Aisha, from Sahih al-Bukhari. Let me scroll back, it's very long hadith. Sahih al-Bukhari, hadith number 6982. Hadith number 6982. Sahih, Sahih, Sahih al-Bukhari, Bukhari. You know, always with an echo so that Muslims don't say, hey, this is fake hadith. No, this is Sahih, Sahih, Sahih al-Bukhari. If we scroll back, Aisha saying, the commencement of the divine inspiration to Allah's messenger, Allah praying on him, still Allah is praying. We don't know why Allah is praying. I mean, and when he prays, to who does he pray? We don't know. Allah wa'ala. Allah knows best. Was in the form of good, righteous, true dreams in his sleep. He never had a dream, but that it came true like bright daylight. Oof, oof, oof. Where is Christian Prince? Oof, oof, oof. He used to go in seclusion, the cave of Hira, where he used to worship Allah alone. Muslims question. If Muhammad used to worship to Allah, are you telling me that Allah was uh, a well-known moon idol? So what Aisha is saying here basically, Muhammad was a pagan. He used to worship Allah, the supreme moon idol. Oof, oof, oof. So thank you for telling us that Muhammad was a nice little pagan Abdul before he became a real Abdul. So he used to worship to the moon idol Allah continuously for many days and nights. So he was a nice little pagan sitting inside the cave. Right? He used to, to take with him the journey foods for that stay and then came back to his wife Khadija, his first wife, remember? Guys? To take his food, likewise again, for another period to stay. So he went again in that cave, right? Dreaming and trying to get messages from Allah, the supreme moon idol. So he was a nice, being a nice little pagan, med meditating and whatnot in that cave. Lord knows what he did in that cave by himself. I mean, imagine guys, you are sitting. Hello, Tippy Bear. Welcome to God bless every admin, guys. Keep them in their prayers, in your prayers, guys. Please pray for our admins. They are doing an amazing job. God bless you too, sister. Longinus of Jerusalem, you too, Phil Herrera. <clears throat> so... Muhammad was sitting in a cave by himself. I mean, try to sit in a cave by yourself for a very long time. I think you will receive a, a lot of nice delusions, right? Camping in a, inside the cave. What a nice story. Oof, oof, oof. Where's Christian Prince, man, when you need him? Till suddenly the truth descended. The truth descended? So are you telling me Muhammad had no truth yet? He was a nice little pagan? So the truth... Wait, guys, question. Are you telling me the truth is, is Jibreel? But last time I checked, 
the truth, Al-Haq is one of the 99 names of Allah. Now when in, the angel descended, so here Jibreel is called the truth. So Jibreel and Allah are the same and one guy? They are the same guy? Uh-oh. Well, according to this hadith, guys, according to Aisha, the truth is the angel. So Allah and Jibreel are the same creature. Oof, oof, oof. Aha! Oh boy, oh boy. Now we understand and we can make the conclusion that Jibreel and Allah share the same name and same being. So the truth, <laughs> Lord have mercy. So the truth descended, Jibreel descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira. The angel came to him in it, in the cave, and asked him to read. Remember when we said the first chapter is not Surah al, uh, al Fatiha? No, no. Right? It was read. That's how the Quran starts, according to Muslims. So, the Muslims have corrupted the Quran nicely, even in a chronological order. So, they played with the Quran, as we mentioned. Yeah, the truth had a book. So, the Prophet Momo Muhammad, Allah praying on him, replied, I do not know how to read. This is false translation. Ma'ana biqari means I cannot read. Right? So they have to fix it in the translation, guys. Uh, Muhammad's replying to Jibreel saying, Ma'ana biqari, I cannot read. It doesn't, he didn't say, I do not know how to read. This is false translation. Like always, right? Muslims need to fix the story when they translate. So the angel, so Muhammad saying, Jibreel caught me forcefully. So here, Jibreel started to squeeze Muhammad like a grape. Right? So I, I'm not sure what Jibreel was, what his intention was. Did he want to uh, make some nice delicious sauce from Muhammad? I don't know. Why are you squeezing the guy, man? Jibreel, take it easy, man. Take it easy. Take a CC, Jibreel. Take it easy, man. Right? Take it easy on Muhammad. So the Injil caught Muhammad and squeezed him and pressed him so hard. And he's saying, I could not bear it anymore. So Jibreel was a really strong guy, man. He was manhandling Muhammad. I think Jibreel, we should, tell, we should, we should tell Jibreel to first go easy on Muhammad. And first time, next time when he comes to Muhammad, don't forget to say, Salamu Alaikum Muhammad. Peace be upon you, Muhammad. So Jibreel didn't even say hello, peace be upon you. He started immediately to manhandle Muhammad, squeezing him like a grape. Maybe some sauce would come out of him. He then released me, so Jibreel released Muhammad and again asked me to read. So again, Iqra, read. And Muhammad replied, I replied, I cannot read. Again, a false translation here. Whereupon Jibreel, again, <laughs> he caught me. <laughs> I think Jibreel was having a nice time here. And pressed me a second time. So for the second time, guys, Jibreel is squeezing Muhammad. to count. Maybe some juice will come out of his head. Till I could not bear it anymore. So Muhammad almost died, guys. Muhammad almost died. Sounds like a nice movie. He then released me. So Jibreel again released Muhammad and asked him again, read. But again, I replied, I do not know how to read. Again, a false translation. Ma'ana biqari, I cannot read. Here, guys, they tried to be a little bit honest. Uh-oh. Or what shall I read? Did you catch it, guys? I mean, Jibreel, next time bring something for Muhammad to read from, right? There was no book to read from. So Muhammad said, I cannot read because there is no book to read from. See, here, they busted themselves. They exposed themselves in the translation. Did you catch it? What shall I read? I cannot read because there is nothing to read from. 
seems that Muhammad was not illiterate after all, right? He could read and write better than you and me, Arabic, <laughs> right? Remember, Muhammad was a merchant. He was working for Khadija as the number one merchant of Mecca because she was the richest lady. Imagine if you cannot read and write as a merchant, right? You know, disaster upon disaster. Anyway, let us continue. Thereupon he called me for the third time. So again, Jibril squeezing Muhammad. Again asking to read. Read. Right? I don't want to read the whole hadith for you guys. It's really long. But Muhammad, after his experience, he returned to Khadija uh, with his neck muscles twitching. Oof, 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 right? With terror. So Muhammad was really with terror, afraid to the point, you know, that he started to sweat. He entered upon Khadija and said, cover me, Khadija, cover me. I'm afraid, cover me. I mean, question Muslims, when an angel comes to you, should you be afraid or should you be comforted by the angel first? Salamu alaikum, ya Muhammad. Peace be upon you. No, the angel was doing all kinds of things to him. Lord knows what he did to Muhammad, right? Lord knows. We know it's a demon. I mean, if, if it's a demon, not, I'm sure he's not coming in peace, right? He will manhandle you. And that's what happened to Muhammad. He was squeezing him like a grape. So they covered him till his fee was over. And then he said, oh, Khadija, what's wrong with me? <laughs> what's wrong with me? Khadija, what's wrong with me? Then he told her everything. So he told his wife everything that had happened and said, I fear that something might happen to me. You know what the words of Muhammad were? They are not mentioning this here. But if you go to Sirat al-Nabawiyah, right? The early biography about Muhammad's life in uh, the Sirah of Ibn Hisham, Ibn Hashaq, Muhammad is saying, a demon came to me from the mouth of Muhammad. These are not my words, guys. You can go and do some research. Muhammad is saying a demon came to me. Right? So Muhammad, his first feeling was that the demon came to him. And first feelings are, are always right, right? So, but it was Khadija who told him, no, no, never, never. I mean, Khadija, question Muslims. How does Khadija know? That it's not a demon, but an angel. Please answer my question. How is Khadija knowing? How is she sure that it's an angel and not a demon? Did she see Jibreel? No. So how do you know it's an angel? It's an assumption, people. And we know what an assumption is. It's the mother of all peepups. Right? I don't want to say the word. Come on, man. Maybe some children and women are watching. So, can you create a religion on top of an assumption? On basis of an assumption? So, are you telling me Muslims believe in Islam and Muhammad because of Khadija? It's nothing but an assumption. Yeah, Khadija is the real prophet. Exactly. Muhammad said, I have been approached by the demon. But she said, no, 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 no. You know, they are not including it here in the hadith. But if you go to the biography, you will see that Muhammad is saying, a demon came to me. So, but have the glad tidings for by Allah will never disgrace you. You, as you keep good reactions with your kith and kin, speak the truth. So Muhammad was a truthful guy. You're right. So because of this, he must be a prophet. I mean, I know a lot of people who are nice who are very respectful, they help the poor. Are, are they all prophets now? According to Khadija, because of Muhammad is helping the poor, he is being nice, now that means he's, he must be a prophet. Khalas, it's over, he must be a prophet. Right? So you serve your guests generously. I mean, I know a lot of people who are very generous. Right? Are we all prophets now, if we are nice? What a nice, wonderful assumption Khadija gave for the Muslims. And guys, this is the first, the first beginning of Islam, right? 
So Islam is created on the assumption of Khadija. Then look what happened guys. Khadija then accompanied him, Muhammad, to her cousin Waraka. Now Muslims say Waraka was a Nasrani. He was a so-called Christian. Last time I checked, we Christians in the Middle East, we don't call ourselves Nasrani or Nasara, right? Nasrani, singular, Nasara, plural. I'm not a Nasrani, guys. I am a Masihi. Masihi coming from the Messiah, right? We are followers of Al Masih, the Christ. Al Masih means the Christ. So, why is this guy called Nasara or Nasrani? Lord knows. Allahu A'la. So, he was not a Masihi like me. This guy was a Nasrani, right? And look what it's saying. He was called bin Waraq bin Nufil bin Asad bin Abdul Uzza. Oh oh, Abdul Uzza, guys. This guy was not actually not a Christian. He was slave of Al Uzza. Who is Al Uzza, guys? Question: Who is Al Uzza? Who is Al Uzza? Anyone? Can anyone tell me in the chat who Al Uzza is? Pagan idol, thank you. So, Waraq ibn Nufil and his family were nothing but pagans, worshipping idols. And Al Uzza, guys, was one of the daughters, one of the three daughters, to be specific, of the supreme moon idol. Allah together with his wife the son Akbar so Allah and Akbar the son with his wife had three daughters and Al Uzza is one of them so what a Qibn Nufil he comes from the family who were nothing but pagans worshipping idols did you catch it so Waraka was the son of her paternal uncle i.e. her father's brother who during the pre-islamic period became a Christian Muslims I will give you a thousand dollars. I will give you a thousand dollars if you can show me the word Christian in the Arabic text here. I will give you a thousand dollars if you can show me the word Masihi. Guys, it says Christian, right? Where is the word Masihi in this text? I will give you a thousand. I will give you hundred thousand dollars. I don't have that money, but you know, we have a lot of supporters. I'm sure a lot of you will help me out to give. To hand over the hundred thousand dollars <laughs> if they can show me the word Christian this word here in the translation in the Arabic text the word guys is Tanassar Tanassar means he became a Nasrani <laughs> Nasrani does not mean Christian guys like we said, Christian means in Arabic, Masihi. I'm a Masihi, I'm a Christian. So, see guys how they are playing with the translation? Right? Playing with translation. And this guy used to write the Arabic writing and used to write the Gospels in Arabic. So, this guy, this Waraq ibn Nufil, guys, he could speak and write Aramaic like I do. I know Aramaic too. I'm a, an Assyrian Christian who speaks Aramaic. So this guy was translating the gospel. He had access to the gospel. You see, it was not corrupted in the time of uh, Muhammad. You see, Muslims say the gospels have been corrupted. Liars? Clearly, Muhammad had access to the gospels in Aramaic also it seems in Arabic so it was not corrupted right yeah waraka means paper exactly to be bear so it seems that in the time of Muhammad the Gospels were not corrupted right according to Islam so question Muslims when did the Injil the gospel became corrupted after the time of Muhammad seems that the Muslims correct you know, collected all the, uh, all the Injils and started to corrupt them, right? 
You know how many copies of the Injil was there in the time of Muhammad? Uh, Nasara Marijana were basically a sect. They were a sect, you know. Some people say they were like people like Jews. They were Jews. Some others say they were like a Christian sect who uh, were kicked out of the church. We don't know exactly because there are a lot of different opinions about it. That sect, guys, that sect, the Nasara, they don't exist anymore. Muhammad kicked them out. He get he got rid of them. They don't exist anymore. Right? So we can't be sure exactly what they were, but they were not Christians because a Christian is a Messihi. We have been calling ourselves always Messihiun, uh, plural Messihiun, one Christian Messihi. Right? So who, what is a Nasara? We, we have no clue, to be honest with you. I never met a, a Nasara before. Did you meet a Nasara before, guys? I didn't. I never seen, I never spoke to a Nasara guy before. Or Nasrani in this case. So, what is happening here, guys? Waraq ibn Nufl was translating the gospel for Muhammad. This is why Muhammad could steal many stories from the gospel. Right? This is why Muhammad is talking nonsense about Jesus in the Quran. Right? Right? Now you understand, what? Right? Now you understand. Aha! Uh -huh. So, Waraka was translating Gospels for Muhammad as Allah wished him to write. Wait a second, Muslims. Are you telling me Waraka now became a prophet too? Because here it says Allah wished that Waraka was writing for uh, Gospels in the Arabic. Now, Waraka is a, a prophet in Islam too. But Muhammad can read. That's a lie, my friend. Muhammad can read and write very good. Actually. Muhammad can write and read very good. He was not an illiterate, right? Let me see if I can find for you that hadith. Just a second. Right. Let me show you. So Muhammad is saying before he's dying, he's on his deathbed saying, get me a pen and paper so that I will write for you a will for so that you're not deviated after me. So Muhammad is saying, get me pen and paper. I will write something for you down that you will not go astray. This is from Sahih al-Bukhari, guys. Right? This is from Sahih al-Bukhari. Right? Did you catch it? Not my words. This is Sahih al-Bukhari, the second most trusted source after the Quran in Islam. Right? So Muslims can't say this is a lie. Did you see? Did you catch it? Oof, oof, oof. So Muhammad, the proof is in front of you. He could write and read very well. And this is how he could steal stories from the Gospels, from the Old Testament, from the Torah, right? Give it his own twist, corrupt it and put it in Quran, right? Then the proof is in front of you because he's asking for a pen and paper. Right. So, so here Waraq ibn Ufl was helping Muhammad with the Gospels. So he was an old man, according to this hadith. If we continue, Waraq was an old man and had lost his eyesight. Muslims question. Question: If you are blind, if you are blind, how can you write? Gospels in Arabic. Please answer the question. If Waraq ibn Nufl is blind, 
How is it possible to write Gospels in Arabic? Yeah, he's blind. You see it? Makes sense, right? Makes sense. Muslims, is this, is this your best that you got about the life of Muhammad? You see, here, Aisha busted Muhammad. She busted the cousin of Muhammad. This is from the mouth of Aisha, right guys? Lord of mercy. So let us continue. Disaster upon disaster. So Khadija said to him, Oh my cousin, listen to the story of your nephew. The story of Muhammad. Waraka asked, Oh my nephew, what have you seen? So Waraka is asking Muhammad, What have you seen? Then Muhammad says, Allah praying on him, described whatever he had seen. Huh? How Jibril came to him and started to squeeze him like a grape. So Waraka said, This is the same Namuz. Muslims and Christians who are listening and watching. Waraka didn't say this is Jibreel. You know, this part, this Abdul, this who is suffering from Abdulism, he added this part to the hadith. In the Arabic, it doesn't say that. Guys, Waraka is saying to Muhammad, this is the law. Namus means law. And law of who? If we continue reading, whom Allah has sent to Moses. So Waraka is telling Muhammad, what you have received is the law of Allah that is sent to Moses. He is not saying, Jibril came to you. <laughs> so when you Muslims, they lie to you, they say, no, no. Waraka is saying to Muhammad, it's Jibril. No, Waraka never said or mentioned the name Jibril. Did you catch it? Right? Hello, welcome, uh, Bali Rego. Welcome. Welcome, everybody who just joined in. So, as you see in front of you, this is basically, in a nutshell, a pre-Islamic story about what happened to Muhammad in his early days, you know? And if we scroll down, Waraka then died, right? Waraka then died. So after the incident, guys, Waraka died. You catch it? So Waraka died and the divine inspiration stopped. Guys, do you see something fishy here? So when Waraka died, guys, remember, Waraka was translating the gospel of the Christians in Arabic for Muhammad. So when Waraka died, the so-called, so-called divine inspiration through Jibreel was paused. Guys, do you see something fishy? What's the fishy part here? What do guys what can we conclude? What can we conclude here? The conclusion is the conclusion is because Waraka died, Muhammad had no translations anymore from Waraka to copy from from the gospel and put it in Quran boom so clearly the ayahs were given from uh, the so-called ayahs that were given from Jibreel to Muhammad were nothing but translations of the gospel from Waraka ibn Nufil and Muhammad became so sad if we continue reading Muhammad became so sad as we have heard that he intended several times to throw himself from the tops of the mountains. Because he could not receive translation of the gospel, you know, here, Waraka was helping him in creating ayahs for the Quran, right? He was helping him. So, Muhammad became so sad to the, to the point that he wanted to commit suicide over and over. So, and every time Muhammad wants to kill himself, to humiliate himself, the so-called Jibreel came and said to him, Oh Muhammad, you are indeed Muhammad's of, or Allah's messenger. You know, and he was stopping him from killing himself, from throwing himself from the mountain top. I mean, if I was a Muslim now, I would be really ashamed. Why? Because 
I am following a suicidal prophet. If I go to a doctor, guys, if I visit a doctor now, and I tell him, listen, I have suicidal thoughts like Muhammad. What do you think the doctor will tell me? Muhammad is being suicidal, man. Yeah, the whole prophethood was a scam. Exactly, Marjana. So, Waraka was giving him ayahs. Muhammad was putting them in the Quran. And because Waraka died, right, Muhammad became suicidal. So, the doctor will say, you are mentally ill, my friend. Let me subscribe for you some medicines. Depression. Mentally ill person. And we know from the early biography of Muhammad, Muhammad used to fall down on the ground with foam on his mouth, having epileptic, epileptic attacks. So, he severed from suicidal thoughts. He was mentally ill. He was falling on the ground with foam on his mouth, having seizures. Right? Is this a normal person, guys? Does this sound like a normal person to you? Having suicidal thoughts? Wanting to kill himself over and over? Not once, not twice, but at least three times. Yeah, shaking too hard, epileptic attacks, schizophrenia. Yeah. When you ask a, a Arabic speaker, what can you make a conclusion? He will say, it's, this is schizophrenia. That's how we call sh someone who's schizophrenic in Arabic. Schizophrenia. Right? See, every time Muhammad wants to kill himself, every time, over and over. So, I hope uh, the one who was asking in the chat for some pre-Islamic introduction, well, this is the pre-Islamic introduction, guys. I hope you have some time, guys, because we are not finished yet. I think this is going to be a very long live show. So, I hope you have some cookies, you have some coffee or tea. I mean, if, you, if, you may, if someone here has a nice cup of coffee for me, I have a little headache. Maybe you can give me some, uh, a nice coffee. I hope it's from Colombia, guys. I hope someone has some nice, delicious coffee for me. I'm really in need. I have a really bad headache. But guys, that does not hold us back from exposing this satanic cult, right? So let us go to the some historical facts that we can completely annihilate, completely destroy, guys. That th <laughs> basically this first half hour, how long are we alive, guys? Oh, one hour already almost. Wow, 59 minutes passed. Wow, okay. That's what, not what I had in mind. <laughs> anyway, well, it's, it's okay, guys. I hope you are benefiting from today's teaching. Guys, are you enjoying yourselves till now? Should we stop? You have cookies? Vesper, you have cookies? Please, do share, man. Sharing is caring, bro. What's wrong with you, man? Kahwa. <laughs> Tippi Bear, Kahwa. How is, how is your Arabic doing, Tippi Bear? I hope you are getting better in Arabic. Guys, our dear sister here, she is trying to learn Arabic. She'll become a much better apologist Better than me and CP in a couple of months, I'm sure. Yeah, to learn Arabic, to know Arabic is one of the biggest weapons that you can have against Islam. Right? Someone said cookies? <laughs> yeah. So guys, should we, keep, uh, should we continue or should we stop? What do you think? Maybe we can do an, a part two next time, or should we continue? What, do you have time, guys? I mean, I know it's very early yet. We continue. Continue. So you li you're liking this. Aha! You're enjoying this. Okay, okay, okay. That's good. That's good. You don't mind? Okay, Phil, Phil is here with us. Okay, cool, cool, cool. That's good. 
Roasted chitnas. Wow. Sounds delicious, man. You have time, Vesperi? Good. That's good. Irene, everybody, welcome. God bless you. Nice to have you with us. We have more than 100, and, more than 100 people. Wow, the numbers are growing. That's good. That's good. I mean, I'm not, I don't have so, as many as people as uh, Christian Prince have, but we are getting there, guys, slowly. <laughs> it's not about the numbers, right, guys? It's about the truth. And thank you for your support, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Please, guys, take notes. Take notes. Use what we are teaching here against Islam. Because we need to help the people who are in need. Muslims are nothing but victims, right? Help me to help you. Download this video when we are done, right? Download it, cut the parts that you like, and upload it on your social media accounts to help those poor victims that have been lied to all their lives. That's good, Tamara. Keep doing that, sister. So, let us continue, guys. Can we conclude, guys, after what we have talking about more than an hour now? That Muhammad is nothing but a fake prophet, a wolf in sheep clothing, right? Getting ayahs from Waraq ibn Nufil and putting them in the Quran, you know? And clearly, Muhammad had access to the uncorrupted Gospels because Waraq ibn Nufil, as we were reading for you, he was translating from the Gospel for Muhammad. Hey, Habibi, welcome, Habibi. Habib al -Aglab. yeah, you know, you speak Arabic, bro? I can't pronounce your name. You're, you're, you're one of our dear Russian friends. Habibi, Akhi. <laughs> wow. I think a lot of people are learning Arabic here. That's good, man. Uh, Maya Maria is asking, is the Arabic used in the Quran the same with the Arabic used today? Well, Ma Maya Maria, Muslims, Muslims will say yes and no. They will say that the Quran is the basics of the Arabic language, the basics of the Arabic grammar. That's false, right? Mus people before Islam used to talk Arabic, and Muhammad stole many ayahs from a guy called um, Amr al Qais. For example, Dan the Sa'a wa al Qamar, Muhammad stole it from him. He, he used to also not only steal from the Gospel, as we mentioned earlier. He was stealing from poetry. This is why you find so many poet, poetry in the Quran, right? You can go and find my video about Amr al Qais. Uh, I had a nice discussion with Christian Prince before, right, guys? It's on my YouTube channel. You can find that discussion that I had with Christian Prince live on his live show about Amr al Qais, how Muhammad was stealing from Amr al-Qais. Yeah, Amr al-Qais, exactly like Phil Horeira is putting it for you in the text, guys. So if you are interested, go find it between my other videos. I have so many videos, you know, the list is, is getting bigger and bigger. Sometimes I can't even find my own videos. This is how many videos I'm having lately. Yeah, look it up, guys. If you are interested about my conversation with Christian Prince about Amr al-Qais, Go find that video. It, it is between my other videos, right? So let us continue, guys. In one of my live shows, and that live show was taken down by YouTube, unfortunately. My live show about this guy, this is Khalid ibn Walid. Khalid ibn Walid. He was the general of Abu Bakr. He was a murderer and a cannibal. This guy that you see here, this, uh, this is an actor in a movie about, uh, you know, the warfare and uh, how Muhammad used to go on war, attacking other tribes. Muhammad was a nice warlord and this guy here, his general, the general of Abu Bakr, he was a nice cannibal. He set even Muslims on fire. He dig a big hole and put Muslims who didn't want to pay tribute to Abu Bakr when he became a caliph. Remember the story about some, some Muslims wanted to follow Ali. They wanted Ali to become the first caliph. 
but Abu Bakr took the command and this guy he dig a big hole he put them in the hole Muslims he put the Muslims in the hole I kid you not his fellow Muslims and he put them on fire this guy was a sociopath he burned people alive and not only that he even killed a Muslim who was against Abu Bakr he killed him he cut off his head he cooked his head and he ate his head this guy that you see in front of you and in the apostasy wars exactly Marijana you were paying attention last time excellent so this guy fought in the Rida wars that we call the apostasy wars of Abu Bakr and he set people on fire he cut someone's head off and he ate it this same guy Khalid ibn Walid and Muslims are proud about him he, they are proud that this guy was a cannibal yeah real butcher yeah exactly that prophet exactly so about the battles of Muhammad guys you see here in front of you the battle of Muta Muta it happened in September 629 so Muhammad was still alive here remember Muhammad died in the year 632 and this battle happened in the time of Muhammad he went to attack the Byzantine Empire read with me a first conflict with the Arabs and the Byzantine victory so basically the Romans right after a fierce battle now question Muslims and Christians who are watching who lost the battle who lost the battle did the Romans did the Byzantines lose or did the, the Muslim Abduls lose and by the way Muhammad was here eh, guys Muhammad was in this war who lost Muhammad was the loser exactly Muslims question why didn't Allah help Muhammad in victory uh oh Abduls lost yeah exactly so this happened between the Arabs the Muslims and the Romans near the village of Muta which is close to Karak a city in modern Jordan so it happened in today's Jordan right where later the Crusaders built one of the biggest castles in the Middle East see here in this area right modern country Jordan right and the Arabs the Muslims lost badly why didn't Allah help Muhammad this is and by the way this is one of the first conquests guys Muhammad was his ass was kicked here badly Allah was sleeping yeah Allah was sleeping Allah was da'if and this and you call this a prophet guys I mean come on and this is the beginning here Muhammad started to Ray the Christians right he wanted the yellow blondies remember the yellow blondies Muhammad told to go get the yellow blondies and one of the Sahaba guys he said no you know I don't want to because I can't hold myself back because I've, I'm going to get the yellow blondie women the wives of the Romans I will rape them one by one so you know what this guy said to him please don't don't allow me to come with you I am such a rapist I'm a, I will rape them one by one this sounds like a very beautiful uh, companion of Muhammad don't he I mean this guy is saying he is being honest Muhammad if I'm going to participate participate with you in uh, in capturing the the sex slave of the the yellow blonde wives of the Romans I will rape them all so he asked Muhammad to not take him with him and Muhammad said it's okay you know stay stay it's okay at least he's honest right this is in the Quran guys I'm talking about the Quran this is in one of the ayahs of chapter 9 if you go to the tafsir you'll see that this guy is asking please don't allow me to go with you. I will rape them one by one. Right? So Muhammad lost 
really bad from the Christians. The Christians became victorious here. And Allah was silent. Right? Now, if we study carefully, guys, and we ask ourselves the following question. Did Prophet Muhammad, this, did the fake Prophet of the Muhammadans, lose any battle? And are there any sources about this? Yes, they are. They are. So, Muhammad was defeated with the Abduls in the Battle of Uhud in the year 625. So, before the last one that we just mentioned, this one, the Battle of Muta'a, Muhammad also, before that, he lost in the Battle of Uhud. So, not only in the Battle of Uhud. Muslims don't love to talk about these historical facts, guys. Uh oh So, Allah was not only silent once, but he was silent for a second time. So, in the year 625, Muhammad's ass was kicked. He lost the battle. And also in the second war, in 629. Uh oh So the Battle of Uhud happened a year after the Battle of Badr when the Quraysh at Mecca set out to avenge their loss. Badr had been a hastily organized affair for the Quraysh who were simply trying to defend their caravans from Muhammad and his team, his soldiers that were nothing but thugs, caravan raiders. Muhammad was a warlord attacking and raiding the caravans. So the raids continue afterwards, all but forcing them to retaliate. So Muhammad not only was defeated by the Christians, he was also defeated by the pagans. Where is Allah when you need him, Muslims? Where is Allah when you need him? Allah allowing Muhammad to be defeated not only by the Christians, but also by the pagans. Uh oh. Uh-huh. It's halal, Tati Avanus. It's halal to raid caravans. Allah told them to. <laughs> Allah telling you to go and raid caravans? Uh-huh. And Allah not helping you? And you your ass gets gets kicked? That's sad. So Muslim apologists often leave these facts out and even claim that the Muslims were fighting in defense. <laughs> Muslims fighting in defense according to Muslim apologists, which is a lie, right? And the proof is in front of you. They wanted to go and raid the caravans of the pagan Quraysh. Muslims raiding caravans. That's not an act of defense. No, that's offense. And they went to attack the Christian lands. Is that defense Muslims? Liars? You filthy liars? You see? Filthy liars, man. How many times have you heard from Muslims? We only attack ones people who attack us, which is a lie. That's not true. They were ones who were storing. They were the ones who attacked Syria. They are the ones who attacked Egypt. They are the ones who attacked north of Africa. How do you think that Islam spread? By the sword. You're liking this teaching? That's good, guys. That's good. Hope you're keeping awake. Hope the coffee is flowing, guys, and the, cookings are, the cookies are crumbling. Right? But please do share with me, guys. I have nothing to drink. I have nothing to eat. Sharing is caring, right? <laughs> so we continue, guys. What did Muhammad say in the Quran? Muhammad even blamed the Muslims who turned their back on him during the war that he lost. Look what he's saying in Surah Ali Amran, chapter 3. Ayah 155. Muhammad in the Quran. You know, Muhammad was the one fabricating ayahs, right? Pretending to be Allah. Look what Muhammad is saying. Indeed, those of you who turned back on the day the two armies met, it was Satan. So Muhammad is blaming Satan for the loss. <laughs> oof, 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 Christian Prince will say. Yeah, this is chapter 3, Ayah 11, one, one, sorry, 155. 
155. So Muhammad is blaming Satan for the Muslims who were fleeing during the war. So Satan caused them to slip because of some they had earned. But Allah has already forgiven them. So Allah forgave the people who turned their backs on Muhammad. They were scared to that they would be butchered by who? By the pagans in 625 and by the Christians in 629. So Muhammad lost two battles. And this is a prophet of God? Muslims, a prophet of, of God, a prophet of God loses battle? Uh-oh. And then Muhammad, you know, to keep his men motivated, blaming Satan for the loss. Yeah, always, it's always say, always blame Satan, right? Right? Where is Allah? Why is Allah being silent? I mean, come on, Allah, should you not help Muhammad and his men to defeat the pagans and the Christians? Where is Allah when you need it? Guys, who is this guy? I mean, look at this, man. What a nice, beautiful drawing. Who is this guy? Anyone knows who this guy is? That you see in front of you. Who is this guy, man? Who is this guy? Is this Satan? Is this Allah? Or is this Burak? Are you sure? Is, is this Al Burak? Are you sure, Phil? Are you sure, John? Who is this guy? This is Jibreel? <laughs> No, guys, this, this creature that you see here is Al-Buraq, okay? Half human, half mule, donkey, whatever, right? Now, this beautiful creature here, mystical creature, is the invention uh, of Muhammad, right? Muhammad was having a nice... dream whatever you want to call it and the story goes like this muhammad jumps on this on the back of this beautiful creature and he flies from mecca to the farthest mosque al-aqsa right so from the masjid al-haram to masjid al-aqsa on the back of this beautiful creature <laughs> muhammad saying <laughs> Let's go. Riding like a jockey, right? Think about it. Beautiful story. Anyone is convinced? Anyone convinced to be a Muslim now? Are you convinced to say the Shahada? Sounds like a beautiful pagan story, right? That's not. <laughs> now, why did I bring this up, guys? Here's why. You can find basically the story about this so-called historical event in Islam. <coughs> Let me clear my throat. You can find it in chapter 17 in Surat Al-Isra. Right? The story about this creature, Muhammad jumping on his back and flying from Masjid Al-Haram, Masjid Al-Haram to Masjid Al-Aqsa. Now, Guys, this is basically the main topic of today that I really wanted to discuss about. Muslims have always claimed when we ask them, where is Masjid al-Haram? They say this is Mecca. Okay. Okay. But where is Masjid al-Aqsa? Guys, where is Masjid al-Aqsa? They will tell you, Muslims will tell you, without any evidence, without any shame, they will say this is Jerusalem. Question, do you see Jerusalem here? Do you see Jerusalem anywhere? No. Yeah, they will say it's Jerusalem. So Muhammad traveled on the back of this half human being, half donkey or mule or whatever this creature is. He jumped on his back. He flew from Mecca, from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. So from here to here. There, right? Question, Muslims. When was Masjid al-Aqsa built? 
Anyone have an, a nice idea? When was the Masjid Al-Aqsa built? Yeah, this is a religion? <laughs> right? Actually, Masjid Al-Aqsa, guys, was built in the year 705. If you go to Prophet Google, peace be upon him, If you go to Prophet Google, peace be upon him, and you do a nice search, it says Al-Aqsa Mosque built in 705, right? I googled that, and, and I get this back as a result. Al-Aqsa Mosque located in the old city of Jerusalem, right? So it's in Jerusalem, right? Today is the third holiest site in Islam. The mosque was built, now pay attention guys, the mosque was built on top of the Temple Mount, known as the Al-Aqsa. Now who built this, who built this mosque guys? It was built by the Umiyyad Caliph, right? Abdel Malik, remember this name guys, this is a very important guy, for me this is a very important guy. Because, and I think I'm going to mention him many times in my upcoming live shows because this guy he made Islam look as it is now right now as you know it this guy had a really huge influence to Islam as we know it this guy created a lot of fabrications about Islam as we know it this guy is the same guy who wrote the name of Muhammad the first time that we see the name of Muhammad in history he was the one responsible on the name of Muhammad. We didn't see the name of Muhammad in history before this guy. And he put the name of Muhammad on Dome of the Rock. Right? He's the one responsible. Right? Remember this name, Abd Abdel Malik. He is the caliph of his time, right? So in the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built and finished. So this guy dies. Remember, this guy dies. Then Al-Aqsa Mosque is finished by son Al-Walid in 705. Question. Muslims. Question. Question. This mosque, as we just read, has been built in 705. Let's say this is Al-Aqsa Mosque. Or this one. I, don't, I really don't care. Pick and choose. So let's say this is Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca. Muhammad is going to there, right? From here to there, from Mecca to Jerusalem. Muhammad died in 632. Guys, Muhammad dies in 632, right? In the year 632. Al-Aqsa, as we just read, was built and finished in 705. Are you telling me, Muslim, question, are you telling me that Muhammad, after his death, he jumped on the back of this guy again, and he went in the future to visit Al-Aqsa Mosque? Be remember, Muhammad died in 632, right? 632. Are you telling me this creature can go in, in the future? Beat me up, Scotty. Time travel. Yeah, so this... Creature can go do tra time travel. This is a time travel machine. Of course, this doesn't sound fishy, right, guys? This doesn't sound fishy at all. Time travel machine? Muhammad could do time travel machine? Can you say the reference always? Sorry, what do you mean? I don't know what you're saying. Uh, so, Muhammad did some nice time travel. Because he died in 632, but this mosque was built much later. Let's say it, this mosque was built much later, in 705. Muslims, you really have a problem with history. You Muslims need to think, how is it possible for Muhammad, dying in the year 632, going to the future to visit a mosque that was built much later after the death of Muhammad? 
So how do you claim that Al-Aqsa Mosque is built in Jerusalem? It didn't exist yet. Oh, oh, oh boy, oh boy. Oof, oof, oof. Right? Who has seen the miracle, Hartanto? Hartanto, show me one Muslim who has seen this miracle except Muhammad. <laughs> right? Who has seen this miracle, guys? Um, Mr. Uh, our Russian friend, it's in the Quran. It's the Quran. Chapter 3, Ayah 1. Sorry. Chapter 17, Ayah 1. Right? It's mentioned in the Quran, guys. This is even stronger than any hadith. And Muslims say we uh, respect the book of Allah, right? This is the book of Allah. So the book of Allah, the Quran mentions this event, right? On the back of this creature. So the Quran is even in Islam, the Quran is even stronger than the hadith. Uh, so history, guys, history, take notes, is Islam's worst nightmare. Yes, you heard it correctly. History is Islam's worst nightmare. Use this in your debates with Muslims, guys. Take notes, please. I think, guys, Muhammad had a DeLorean, right? Anyone seen the movie back in the future wonderful movie you know i think muhammad owned a delorean he went back in the future right he went from 632 to 705 beat me up scotty <laughs> oh no wait that's a different movie right <laughs> marty mcmahon <laughs> You're killing me, along in the subject. You're killing me, bro. You're killing me, bro. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, let me drink some water, man. Back to the Future by Muhammad. Right? So Muhammad owned a time travel machine and he went from 632 to 705 to visit Al-Aqsa Mosque, right? So, as we showed you, that was in part number one, basically. We just proved to you from part number one. This is basically the Al-Aqsa Mosque, guys. This is Dome of the Rock, right? This is Dome of the Rock. Like I said, Al-Malik, Caliph Al-Malik, put the name of Muhammad here on the walls of the Dome of the Rock. We never heard of the name Muhammad before we saw it here on this Dome of the Rock. Right? So this mosque was built basically in the time of Al-Malik, right? Al-Malik and his son finished this mosque. This is Al-Aqsa Mosque, right? This was finished in 705 and Muhammad died in 632. So Muhammad took the DeLorean and he went back to the future to visit this mosque. From Masjid al-Haram, back in the future, all the way to the future, to Al-Aqsa Mosque. Right? Yes, we never heard of Muhammad before. The name of Muhammad before we found it on the walls of this mosque, right? Do you guys like this teaching, guys? You like this teaching? I hope you are enjoying yourselves. But we have another problem, guys. We have another problem. Remember, didn't I say that Islam worst nightmare is history itself? Muslims, guys, take notes, please, for the truth. Take notes. Muslims claim, when we ask them, how is it possible 
that Muhammad went back in the future to visit this mosque. Muslims have a, an answer for this. They say, oh, oh, no, wait. This was the temple of Solomon, the second temple. But wait a second. The Romans, if we do some Google search, we ask Prophet Gugan to help us out. The Romans destroyed the temple of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD. In the year 66 AD, the Jews of Judea rebelled against their Roman masters. In response, the, temper, the Emperor Nero dispatched an army under the generalship of Vespasian to restore order. That same year, the Emperor Nero died by his own hand, creating a power vacuum in Rome. So, the Romans, guys, when Muslims are going to say, no, no, Muhammad visited the temple of the Jews, that's a lie because there was no temple anymore. It was destroyed by the Romans. Did you catch it? So either way, you cannot have a cake and eat it to Muslims. History is still your worst nightmare. You see how history is exposing the lies of any Muslim, right? Yeah, the Prophet used Ahmar, yeah. That's right. He used a donkey. Right? History is Islam's worst nightmare. So either way, Muslims, you have to deal with history itself. And to make it, make it even more worse, guys, to make it even more worse, there's a book called Kitab al-Maghazi by al-Waqidi. Al-Waqidi is a very famous historian and Muslim historian. He became also a judge, right? In his book, in Kitab al-Maghazi, guys, this is a very well-known book. Okay, you can buy it in, on Amazon. It's called the Book of the Raids in Arabic. Let me type it in the text. Al-Waqidi. His book called Kitab Al Maghazi. Okay? If you are interested in historical books about Islam, you should buy this book. Right? Very famous book in Islam. Very trustful source to go to when you want to learn about. It's also translated, by the way. But the translation, let me be honest with you, it's a lie. Because if you open the first page, it will say, the guy who translated this book, if you read the book in Arabic, totally different than English. But if you read the book in English, it says all the wars that Muhammad did was, were def defense wars, which is a lie. We just mentioned Muhammad attacked the caravans, which is not defense, offense, and he attacked the Romans, and he lost both. What about attacking Egypt? What about attacking Syria and all the countries that he attacked? And much later, Muslims also conquering lands. So don't lie to us. Right? So this book is describing the wars of Muhammad. Okay? I want to play a video for you guys. Do you know, have you heard of Zakaria Butros, guys? Do you know Zakaria Butros? Have you ever heard of this name before? Anyone heard of Zakaria Butros? Zakaria Butros, guys, is a Coptic priest who used to sit like me on Paul Talk, debating Muslims and Imams. Right? He is a Coptic Christian priest who used to sit on the Paul Talk panel like me, like Christian Prince, like many debaters, old school debaters. Now he owns his own TV channel. Now Zakaria Butros is a Christian, my friend, not Zakaria Naik. What's wrong with you, man? No, yeah, Zakaria Butros, I'm going to play a video for him. Uh, and I also edited this video. And it's one of my lessons, actually. So let me play the video, guys. I have talked about the relocation of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, guys, basically in the third part, we are going to show you what the real location of Al-Aqsa Mosque is, guys. Right? 
the real location of this. This is much later, bro, right? Muslims, and in this case, Caliph al Malik that we mentioned earlier, he named this new mosque that he built after the death of Muhammad Al Aqsa. But the real Aqsa mosque that existed in the time of Muhammad is not this mosque, right? And we're going to prove it to you. And in the, in the video that I'm going to play for you, Zakaria Butros is mentioning this book. This is a very, very authentic book when it comes to history, right? Very authentic. So let me play the video, guys. Enjoy the video. I found a very interesting video in the Arabic section of YouTube from our dear friend Zakaria Butros, who is a Coptic priest. Uh, Muslims put a 60 million bounty on his head if you capture him as a Muslim and cut off his head his head and you present uh, his head on a silver platter to the Islamic world you will get 60 million dollars yes you heard it correctly so let us see what our dear Coptic priest Zakaria Butros is going to teach us today let me uh, translate what he's saying during the video. شفوا عن هذه المفاجأة اليوم من واقع كتب التراث الإسلامية التي تؤكد بأنه كان بالجزيرة العربية. So he's saying today I'm going to uncover the deep hidden or hidden secret about the secret location of the real Al Aqsa Mosque in a area which is in the basically uh, nowadays uh, Saudi Arabia in a area between Medina and Mecca and not Jerusalem <laughs> as the Muslims have claimed for the last 1400 years no the real location of Al-Aqsa mosque is between Medina and Mecca hmm. Al-Aqsa Al Mosque in the area called Al-Jurana, which is very close to Mecca and Medina. He found this deep hidden secret in the very famous book of the early scholar Al-Waqidi in his book Kitab Al-Maghazi. He is a scholar who died in the year 207 after Hijra, after the migration of the Prophet of Islam from Mecca to Medina. Let us continue the video. <laughs> On this page, 958, it says, So the Prophet of Islam went to Al-Jurana on Thursday night. So he stayed in the area Al-Jurana for uh, 30 days. Guys, in this video I misspoke, I said 30 days, I meant to say 13 days, right? Thalatha Ashar, it's 13, okay? I made one small mistake, but let us continue. So he, when he wanted to go to Medina, he went from al Jurana in the night. So he went from Al Jorana, from the Al Aqsa Mosque where he was staying. <laughs> Did you catch it, guys? So Al Aqsa Mosque, Al Aqsa Mosque is in Al Jorana area, and let us see where Al Jorana is. <laughs> It's in the valley called Al-Adwat Al-Qusua. Al-Jarana is in the valley 
which is called Al Adwat Al Qusswa. So I did a so guys, I did a nice Google Maps search, right? I did a nice Google Maps search to see where this Al Jorana is, guys. Please pay pay attention, guys. Okay. This is Al Jorana. I did a just a second. Do you see it, guys? Do you see it? I did a Google Maps search from Al Jorana that was just mentioned. Guys, are you with me? Give me one if you're still with me. I hope you're not falling asleep. How many people are still here, guys? I hope you paid attention to what Zakaria Botros was saying. So he said, the real Aqsa Mosque that is mentioned in, in Kitab al Maghazi, right, by Al Waqidi that you can find on Amazon, you can buy this book. This is a well-documented his historical book about the wars of Muhammad. And I did a nice Google Maps search. I put in Al Jorana, Saudi Arabia. This is Al Jorana, guys. From Masjid Al Haram to Al Jorana. It's only a 31 minute drive with the car. Did you catch it? It's only 31 minutes. Now Muslims have claimed and have lied to us for the last 1400 years that Al-Aqsa Mosque is in Jerusalem, which is a lie. So Muhammad went from here with his Burak, with that donkey, half donkey, half mule, half human being on his back from here to there only, not to Jerusalem. Muhammad was staying here, then he went there. 31 minute drives, guy. This is Al Jorana. Did you catch it? This is Mecca. Yeah, hybrid. <laughs> you see how easy it is to expose the lies of Muslims? Muslims have always lied that Al Aqsa Mosque is in Jerusalem. They actually conquered Mecca after the death of Muhammad. They conquered, uh, sorry, they conquered Jerusalem, right? And they built the new Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. But the Al-Aqsa Mosque that Muhammad is mentioning in the Quran, right? This one, Al-Aqsa Mosque, is this one. It was here. Oof, oof, oof. Friend C team, you missed a lot, my friend. You missed a lot. So you need to rewatch this today's video, okay? Because basically we're almost done. Did you catch it, guys? So it was never Jerusalem. It's only a 31-minute drive from Mecca to Al-Aqsa Mosque, the real Aqsa Mosque. And as we mentioned earlier, Al-Aqsa Mosque, the new one, the new version, was built in the year 705 by Abdel Malik. So you see how Muslims covered, lied about real history? Everything that you have learned from Muslims about the historical facts in Islam are nothing but lies. Covering it up. No, uh, Xeltra, not Muhammad is a liar. No, 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 no. Muhammad didn't lie here, basically. Yes, he lied, of course, in the whole Quran, but he didn't lie about where it is. He never said it's in Jerusalem, right? Remember, you can't find the name Jer Jerusalem here. It was the Muslims, because they wanted to capture Jerusalem, they invented, they invented that Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is not very far from Mecca, it's only a half hour drive, that they are claiming that is Jerusalem, you know? They want to claim Jerusalem, right? So they are playing with history. They are keeping the lies, the Imams and the Shaykh, the Shaykhs are keeping this lie up. It wasn't Muhammad, it was the Muslims who came after Muhammad who played with history. al Jurana, yes. Guys, take notes. al Jurana, where the real location of Al-Aqsa Mosque was 
it's not very far from Masjid al Haram in Mecca. It's only 31 minute drive. So, this Burak only flew from here to there. <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy. So the DeLorean guys of Muhammad in the form of al Burak did not go back in the future. No, no, no. It took only a half hour drive from here to there. Right? Seems it was not a time travel machine after all. That's the conclusion that we can make. It wasn't a time travel machine, guys. Muhammad just went for a walk. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, there are no witnesses, no eyewitnesses. No one saw this event happen. But what we do know is that in Kitab al Maghazi, guys, in this book, we know where the real location of the first Al Aqsa Mosque was. Now, there are some Muslims, guys. There are some Muslims who are going to say, we don't trust Al-Waqidi. Now I'm going to expose those liars, guys. We are going to explore, expose the liars who call Al-Waqidi a liar, right? Yeah, it's Da'if, right? Those you will say it's Da'if. No, 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 Habib, it's not Da'if. This Al-Waqidi was a well-known well and famous judge and historian. I went to this website, guys. I went to this website. Look what this website is. This is not my website. This is a Muslim website. Defending Al-Waqidi and the lies about Al-Waqidi. Pay attention. Let me give you the link. Let me give you the link. Save it. Bookmark it. So, whenever a Muslim going to lie and say Al-Waqidi is not to be trusted, we're going to expose to them and their lies. You know, Muslims always say, yeah, there's always a matter a differing opinion. Some scholars say this, some scholars say that. Well, that's not my problem, right? These are not my scholars. These are your scholars. Uh, you are enjoying that? That's good to hear, Nicole. We appreciate it, right? So if we're going to see if this Waqidi is a trustful person teaching that the real location of Al-Aqsa Mosque is not really far from Mecca, it's only a half hour drive, we can read the following. Read with me and take notes. Al-Waqidi may have been criticized for his work in the field of Hadith. So his Hadith, guys, pay attention, take notes. His Hadith have been criticized, right? But as far as history... His history books, this book, his history books is concerned. Scholars have graded Waqidi extremely thiqa, very trustful. It's doctrine, right? Very authentic when it comes to history. And this is history, right? When we are not mentioning any hadith, right? This is history, historical facts. Right? And he's Sunni, yeah. The Ahl al-Hadith in this regard deem him highly truthful, particularly in the light of the exhortation by his student Imam Ibn Sa'd. Ibn Sa'd, guys, is the student of Al-Waqidi. And he's very famous also for his uh, own work of uh, Al-Kitab al uh, if I'm not mistaken, Al-Kabira or something. Anyway, so this, his student is very famous too, right? Like his master. Al al hadith have called him weak in the field of hadith. Remember, they are calling his hadith weak. Of who? Of Al-Waqidi, right? So his hadith are weak, but only those hadith pertaining to injections such as halal and haram. So only the hadith that are about halal and haram, something is rightful, something is not rightful to do. Only those hadith are weak. 
Those that have graded him weak in hadith didn't do so because of his narrations, but do his mixing up the change of narration. So basically he was mistaken in those hadith that he's weak, he's only mixing up the chain of narrations. So let's say Rob Christian said that and Christian Prince said that and all the way to the end, David Wood said that. So that, na that chain, he was mixing them, right? So he was a little bit mistaken in the chain of narration about his weak hadith. But his other works like Kitab al-Maghazi, this one, is very respectful, very authentic when it comes to history, remember? Right? So his history books are very okay. The Stones Sunni Imam with anti-Shia tendencies, Ibn Kathir, so Ibn Kathir is an anti-Shia, so if Muslims were going to say this is a Shia source. No, no. Ibn Kathir, one of your heroes of Tafsir, right? Of the Quran. Remember Ibn Kathir? Role of Waqidi in Al Bidaya Wal Nihaya. This is the book of Ibn Kathir, guys. So Ibn Kathir is saying, Ibn Kathir is saying, look what Ibn Kathir is saying, guys. Ibn Kathir is saying about Al Waqidi. Al-Waqidi, may Allah mercy be upon him, has some accepted additions and often deliberated history. He is from the grand leaders. So Ibn Kathir is speaking highly about Al-Waqidi. He is the grand leaders of this field. Of what field? Of history. He is trustworthy in himself and generous. So Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir that Muslims love so much, is speaking highly of Al-Waqidi. Muslims, is Ibn Kathir liar? Is he a liar saying that Al-Waqidi is trustworthy? He is generous. Endorsed, yes exactly Peter M. Al-Waqidi is endorsed by Ibn Kathir. Sahih, Sahih. One of the revered Sunni Imams in the field of Rijal, of the men, Namely by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani records. So there's another very famous scholar in Islam. His name is Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. For the people who know Arabic, Abdul Haliga, I remember you speak Arabic, right? You speak Arabic, right? Have you heard of this name before? Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. He is very famous, guys. Very famous scholar. Very trustful scholar. Right? Yeah. Ibn Hajar al this the son of the Stones, that's basically him. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani records another famous guy like Ibn Kathir, right? Is going to speak highly of Al-Waqidi. Records. Look what Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani is going to say about Al-Waqidi. Al-Waqidi is acceptable in the narrations of the battles. In the what? In the narrations of the battles. What was his book? called the book of raids the book of basically battles right by al-waqidi so this book according to ibn hajar al-asqalani is acceptable did you catch it according to our so ibn hajar al-asqalani continues saying according to our companions and allah knows best allahu alam <laughs> they will always end with allahu alam Right? In his book, Talkhis al Habir, Al Habir, sorry, volume 7, page 57. Even the, we have even the source for that, where Ibn Hajar al Asqalani is reporting this about Al Waqidi. Right? He is truthful and highly valued. Uh oh. This is from who? Another great Sunni Imam in the field of Rijal, namely the Habi. The Habi. I don't know this guy anyway, but he seems a very like a very great Sunni Imam. I don't know all the Sunni Imams, to be honest with you. But look how many people. We have at least three highly, highly respected scholars, Sunni scholars. These are not Shia guys. These are Sunni. Ibn Hajar is Sunni. Ibn Kathir is a Sunni. 
So where are the Muslims who are going to call Al-Waqidi a liar? Where are they? Right? You see, you see guys, when we are going to expose Islam, when we are going to expose the historical lies, the historical errors in Islam, we are going to go back to what their Imams saying. We're not, I'm not going to go to a Christian, right? I'm going to the Muslims. These, this is the way to deal with Muslim lies, right? But what do Muslims do, guys? Muslims will go to an anti-Islamic Christian website, right? Anti-Christian Islamic website. They will try to learn about the Bible. No, if you want to learn about the Bible, go to BibleHub.com, for example. Or go to a bookstore, buy, let's say, a nice Holy Bible book, right? Like the uh, King James Version, for example. If you want to learn about Christianity, go and read the Holy Bible yourself. Don't go to an Islamic website like that Zekir Naik or uh, another Abdul, uh, like uh, the liar, the, the liar that I have expanged many times over, Mr. Ahmad Didad himself. I spanked him in a couple of my videos. Go and watch them, guys. You're not going to go to a Muslim to learn about Christianity. No. Look what I'm doing. I'm going to the Muslims to learn about Islam, to do research about Islam. Showing you from the most trustful people what they say about other scholars. That's the way to do it, guys. You see, Muslims can't call us liars, right? Because we're going to your most trusted people, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hajar. The Habi, I think he's a very famous guy too, right? And you can go through all the website, you know. They are going through so many sources to defend the work of Al-Waqidi. So, conclusion. Muhammad never went with his time travel machine. There is no time travel machine. Muhammad simply took a walk from here to there and the real Al-Aqsa Mosque was never in Jerusalem, it was in Al-Jarana, very close to Mecca. Medina is up way north guys, Medina, let me show you where Medina is. Medina is somewhere here, uh, let's see. Here's Medina, right? Here is Masjid Al-Haram, here is Mecca, here is Al-Jarana and here is Medina. So basically in between, almost between. So Muhammad used to go there. He, Muhammad, when he fled Mecca, he went to Medina, right? But when he was staying in Mecca, he went to pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque in Al-Ju'arana, which is very close to Masjid Al-Haram. Only 31 minutes run. So Al-Aqsa Mosque was built later and named after the original mosque in Al-Ju'arana. So by this, guys, we finish today's teaching. I hope you enjoyed today's teaching, guys. And to not forget, guys, it's also mentioned, this historical event is also mentioned in this book, right? In this book. So not only in Al-Waqidi, let me, uh, let's see. Let me get the real name in, uh, let's see, what's it's called in Amazon. It's called Subal, let me copy the name for you if you are interested in also this book. This is the name of this book. Sibal al Huda al Rashad. Okay, so that same event that we just showed you, Zakir, uh, sorry, uh, Zakaria Butros talking about it, that's very close to Mecca. You can also find it in this book. So not only Al Waqidi mentioning it, this is a very respectful book too, mentioning that Al Aqsa Mosque is very close to Mecca. Right? Do we have any Muslims 
Let me open up my Skype, guys. I hope we have Muslims who have the knowledge and the courage to refute my today's teaching. Do we have any Muslim? I mean, we are live for at least two hours now. I hope there are Muslims watching who think have the knowledge and the courage to call me and refute me. Any Muslim? We have only one dislike. That means the Muslims are enjoying our uh, today's live show, guys. Don't you think? They are convinced. I hope we have a lot of ex-Muslims after today's live show. Any Muslim who can stay on topic and refute me. Any Ustaz. Guys, did you like today's topic? Did you like it? Yeah, my Skype ID is the Arab Christian. Do we have any Muslim? Uh, I think about doing more such te teachings about historical facts, guys, that we can expose historical lies and errors, right? Never ever, as you see, never ever trust a Muslim source that is talking about history. Do your own research first to make sure is this guy lying or not, right? So Jerusalem, guys, was never of the Muslims. Muslims have nothing, not, nothing to do with Jerusalem. Muslims have nothing to do with Solomon, the temple of Solomon. You are, you are nothing but pagans, Muslims. That's what we can conclude today after today's teaching. Muslims have nothing to do with the temple of Solomon. Right? Islam is a pagan religion. That's the conclusion of today. Right? There's nothing called Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. It was later built. It has nothing to do with Muhammad. When Muslims conquered Jerusalem, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was Omar who walked the first time on the streets of Jerusalem. They later built the Al-Aqsa Mosque, as we showed you. They simply named the Al-Aqsa Mosque of Jerusalem in 705 after the real Al-Aqsa Mosque in al juran This one here, right? That's only a half hour drive from Mecca. Are there any questions from our dear Christian friends in the chat? Are there any questions? Sorry if I missed your questions during the teaching. Guys, I always say keep your questions to the last, right? After I'm done, because I can't do two things at the same time. I can't answer questions and teach at the same time, okay? So if you have questions, you can ask them now. Right? What do you think about Exodus 21, about slavery? What has it to do with my today's topic? I mean, come on, man. Couple days ago, I mentioned slavery. Why didn't you ask that question a couple days ago when I was talking about slavery? Sorry, um, please, if you, if you want to be, yeah, I, I understand, but if you want to be with me, you are respectful to today's topic, stick with the topic. Okay, okay. so if you are interested, go back, okay? Well, uh, today I'm not going to go off topic. Any Muslim, any Ustaz, does the original Al-Aqsa Mosque still exist? I don't know. I never went to uh, Saudi Arabia. I have no clue. I think in every, in every area, guys, in every area, you have a, a mosque. So I think there is a mosque there called Al-Aqsa. Yeah. Not sure. I never. Did you go to Mecca? I didn't. I'm not allowed to enter Mecca. They will kill me, man. We are not allowed to enter Mecca, let alone other areas. Like Medina also, you are not allowed to enter Medina. So I have no clue. Why, what should I do in Mecca or Medina, man? <laughs> so I have no clue, to be honest with you. I don't care. I'm only here to expose the lies of Muslims. I'm here to expose the lies of Muhammad. I'm here to expose Islam. Right? So yeah, there are other mosques with the same name, as we mentioned. 
there is the original mosque was in the time of Muhammad called Al-Aqsa Mosque was here right as we mentioned in today's teaching no you're not allowed to take pictures inside uh, uh, in Masjid Al-Haram basically if you are in the Kaaba especially when, sometimes they are allow people to enter the Kaaba or the security guys or whatever you are not allowed to take pictures there it's highly forbidden but sometimes they do in secret right did Mecca ex ex exist back then when uh, Christian Guardian when when is when then when when what time do you mean before Muhammad or after Muhammad before Muhammad well I challenge any Muslim to show me the name of Mecca guys I challenge any Muslim to show me a map from the time of Muhammad that exists showing the name Mecca there is nothing called Mecca right we didn't find the name Mecca or Muhammad before uh, the Dome of the Rock I mentioned this during the today's teaching right guys Mecca didn't exist. There is no map. There is no historical map that shows the name Mecca. We found Petra. Right? We know about Petra. Petra is in Jordan, right? If we go to Petra, let's see. We believe, and if you did watch, guys, if you watched. Dan Gibson, have anyone watched Dan Gibson's work, guys? Oh, it's very really far. Look, let me zoom it out. So, the early mosques, guys. Dan Gibson, have you ever heard of Dan Gibson? Dan Gibson used a GPS system that is military grade, guys. Yeah, Tom Holland, yes, that's a nice, really amazing. Uh, documentary also Dan Gibson guys used military grade GPS equipment he went to the oldest mosque the oldest mosque that there is he could not go to this one because he's not allowed to enter Mecca right but basically he was also not allowed to enter Medina as a, as a Christian or non-Muslim right so he went to the oldest mosque that he could find on earth I kid you not. He went to China. There's a very old mosque in China. When he, what he did, he used his military grade GPS system and he tried to look at the Qibla. Guys, the Qibla is basically, how do I, let me try to Google. Qibla, what is Qibla guys? Qibla is basically, if you are in the mosque, it's basically the point where you sit let me try to explain to you the Qibla is the direction that should be faced when a Muslim prays so when you are let's say you are in New York you are sitting in a mosque and you want to pray as a Muslim you have to face the Qibla that's the part of the mosque that faces Mecca right so if you are Let's say you are here, you are or you're sitting here in a mosque, you're sitting here. This is the way to pray to, towards Mecca. Did you, did you catch it? So it's basically the direction of prayer inside the mosque, your local mosque. So what did, let's, let me go back. So what did Dan Gibson do, guys? So let's say he was in China. In one of the oldest mosques, I think it's uh, it's uh, built in the year 600 something, right? 691, much later than the death of Muhammad. But it's one of the oldest mosques. So let's say this is China. China. The mosque is here, right? Dan Gibson is here, guys. He's in China. He's using his military-grade GPS system. And he's... 
pointing from the Qibla, the direction of prayer, to try to face Mecca. No, it didn't face Mecca. It faced Petra. Did you catch it? So instead of facing Mecca, that Qibla of the Chinese mosque, it, instead of facing Mecca, it's facing Petra. Do you, do you understand what is happening here, guys? Do you understand what is happening here? If you didn't, give me a two. Then I will explain it again. Did you catch what I'm trying to explain? So Dan Gibson with his military grade GPS system, it is not pointing the Qibla, the direction of prayer of that early mosque, is not facing Mecca here, it's facing Petra. And Allah knows best. Allahu alam what's the problem here? <laughs> so we can conclude from Dan Gibson, his study, his research, that there was nothing called Mecca. Oof, oof, oof. Mecca didn't exist. So the early mosques that were built were facing Petra. Uh-oh. So as you see, the historical evidence are Islam's most enemy, highest enemy. History itself, the historical evidence are Islam's worst nightmare. Wrong direction, exactly. So instead of facing here, it's facing there. <laughs> Imagine you're sitting here, you're praying in that old mosque. Instead of facing Mecca, you are facing Petra. I, I know, I'm not sure you will learn. You tell me. I think there was nothing called Mecca. There was nothing called Mecca. Right? Now, some, some Muslims, guys, some Muslims, there are Muslims who are trying to basically address this historical disaster. You know what they say? They call it Becca, right? They say Becca is Mecca. Why? Because the Quran speaks of Becca, right? The Quran speaks of Becca. I think it's in chapter 48, 24. Let us go to chapter 48, 24. Are you with me, guys? Give me one if you are still with me. I hope you didn't feel, fell asleep because this is really important stuff. Uh, is this the right ayah? Or not? It's not? What was the ayah again where it's talking about Becca? Oh, six, sorry, 692. I was in the wrong, looking in the wrong chapter. 692, I think. Why is it not giving me the right one? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. The mother of the cities. Okay, so this one is talking about the mother of the cities. So basically Mecca. But I want to find Becca, you know, because there's an ayah where it speaks of Becca. Hmm. Well, anyway, there is an ayah in the Quran. I kind of can't find it at the moment. But they say that that Becca, guys, that Becca is the same Becca that is mentioned in the Holy Bible. But the Holy Bible, guys, the Holy Bible says that it's a place with water. It's a place where olive trees are grown. Olive trees, remember? Olive trees. Now, where do olive trees grow? Guys? Olive trees in the Middle East grow around the Mediterranean Sea, right? Let's say Italy, 
uh, Spain, Morocco, you know, basically all the countries that surround the Mediterranean Sea, right? Did you catch it? But Mecca is in the desert. 396? Didn't I just check 396? Maybe not. Let's see. 90. Well, here. So this is a foster. <laughs> I was looking at the translation, guys, not the Arabic. You see these liars, man? Sahih International. Filthy liars. Let me switch to Pictol. Let's see what Pictol is saying. You see how they are lying, guys? Did you catch the lie? You see? <laughs> you see why you can't trust these three women? Remember when I said three women, a team of three women, named themselves Sahih International. These were converts, not real, not actually real Muslims, born Muslims. They were lying. When they wrote the Quran and their translation, guys, is the most used translation. Look how they are lying. Filthy, disgusting liars. Here, the Arabic says, be Becca, right? Add Becca. See? So this translation is talking about Becca. See? So Muslims, now Muslims, they will say that Becca is the Becca of the Bible. No. The Becca of the Bible is mentioning olive trees. Now, challenge Muslim. Do olive trees grow in the time of Muhammad in that hot desert? No, you need a lot of water. Even the ground is not working. Right? Olive trees, yes, and this is why I'm talking about olive trees grow here, right? In Petra, around Petra, Jerusalem. So Becca that you're talking about is not so here Muhammad guys when he's talking about Becca it's not Mecca Becca is in Jerusalem around Jerusalem Jordan here somewhere it's Becca right so the real Becca is here around this is the Medi Mediterranean Sea right guys do you see it this is the Mediterranean Sea so the Becca the real Becca is here not here Liars? <laughs> you see how easy it is, guys? You see how easy it is to expose liars? You see how easy it is to expose the Quran? Lies. Disasters on top of disasters. Right? Uh-oh. Yeah. Peter M, you're correct. <laughs> Quran is peeped, yeah, it's crude. Becca is in Lebanon. Someone is saying Becca is in Lebanon. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Let's see, Becca, Lebanon. Becca Valley, oh, okay, look at that. One thousand seven hundred and seventy kilometers, guys. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> oh man. Anyone take a beer? Anyone convinced to become a Muslim now? I mean, you, you must be convinced, right? Way up there, yeah, exactly. Uh-oh. I think the guy who wrote this ayah, guys, the guy who wrote this ayah, I think it was one of the scribes. Maybe it was Ibn Abi Sarah, guys. Phil, do you remember, uh, do you remember uh, last time's uh, Ibn Abi Sarah? Anyone? Ibn Abi Sarah who wrote the ayah Tabaraka, right? Glory, the one, the best of creators, right? I think he maybe he confused himself here. He was taking hashish. Yeah, the best of creators that was not from Allah, right? That was the guy, yeah, Ibn Abi Sarah. Guys, click on the link, save it, that Phil Huraira just provided.
So this, maybe it was the same guy who was writing this and he confused Becca with Mecca, right? But we know the Quran was corrupted, you know, to make it sound like it's from the Abrahamic faith, the real Abrahamic faiths, right? They want to force Islam into the Holy Bible, basically, right? That's what they are looking after. They are trying to force Christianity, our holy prophets, inside Islam, forcing Islam inside the Holy Bible, basically. Islam has nothing to do with the Jews. It has nothing to do with the Christians. But they are forcing, they are trying to show you that Muhammad is one of the true prophets, which he's clearly not. Islam, yeah, basically ends up creating Islam. Islam is basically Islam of Muhammad. Remember how Waraq ibn Nufal was translating the Quran for Muhammad? Sorry, the Injil for Muhammad? Giving him translation so he can add it to his Quran? Remember the hadith? Right? So, Waraka was translating the Injil for Muhammad. Right? Then, when Waraka died, Muhammad wanted to commit suicide because he could not get any ayahs from Waraka anymore to use it in the Quran. It's nothing but a man-made book, lies on top of lies, historical errors on top of historical errors. Like I said, history is Islam's worst nightmare. Oh. What are you going to do with this, Muslims? Huh? What are you going to do? Either you're going to choose to leave Islam or if you want to have your 72 virgins, just stay, you know, be in it, stay in the filth of Islam, stay in the sexual cult called Islam, stay in the dark. But if you really care about your salvation, you care about being saved, I invite you to come back to Jesus Christ. Please come back home, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Muhammad cannot help you, Muhammad is still dying. He's still death in his grave and somewhere in Medina. But we know Jesus is alive in heaven. You want to be with the someone who is alive, who never died, according to Islam? Jesus never died, right? Or you want to be with someone who is very dead and rotting in his grave somewhere in Medina? Please come back home, guys. The Bible says every knee will bow and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. You want to follow a dead man? Exactly. You want to follow a dead man or you want to follow the holy, sinless Jesus who is alive together with the Father in heaven? What do you want to do, guys? Choose your destiny. Yeah, by, by the way, guys, <clears throat> I tried... I tried to call our brother Christian Prince that other day when he was talking about chapter 4. Let me go to the ayah. He was mentioning, I was watching. Sometimes guys like you, I also go and try to watch and support our dear friend Christian Prince. I know he's one of my dear friends to heart, right? I used to sit with him on Paul Talk. We used to have a lot of fun together. So he was talking about chapter, let's see, chapter 157 from chapter 4. Sorry, chapter, chapter 4, I 157. Let me go to that ayah. He was mentioning this ayah, guys. Remember? It's talking, basically talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, right? Remember when... Christian Prince was explaining this ayah to you guys, you remember? Christian Prince was saying the following, basically. The Jews, here Allah is repeating after the Jews. So according to Allah, the Jews are saying, now take notes guys, I want to add something to, on top of this, All right?
The Jews are saying, we slew the Messiah, right? That's what they are saying. We slew the Messiah. Now, question Muslims. Can you show me in the history of all the Jews, can you show me an, a Jew who said, a famous Jew who said, we slew the Messiah? How is it possible for them to slew the Messiah while they are still waiting for the Messiah? So how can any Jew make this claim? That's not possible. They are still waiting for him, right? Yes, the Jews wanted Jesus dead, right? There's nothing called Jesus, by the way. It's Isa, but anyway. So how is it possible for a Jew to make such a claim while they are still waiting? How can you kill someone who did not not come them for them yet, right? This stupidity, exactly, Peter. Uh-oh. Oh boy, oh boy. Oof, oof, oof. How is that possible, Muslims? Can you show me one Jew who, who dares to make this claim? We slew the Messiah. It's their saying, right? The Jews are talking here. They are still waiting for the Messiah. So they never made this claim. This is a lie. Right? Problem number two, guys. According to the Quran here, in this same ayah, it says, They slew him not, nor crucified him. Wait a second. Problem number two. So this was the problem number one. We just showed you the lie about the Jews. They are, Muhammad here is lying about the Jews. The Jews never said we slew the Messiah. Yes, they, want, they wanted Jesus dead, but they, but they never accepted Jesus to be their Messiah, right? Only the Jews who became Christians, right? But the Jews who stayed ignorant, especially the Jewish Sanhedrin leaders, they never accepted Jesus to be the Messiah. So they will never ever make this claim. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, the Jews didn't have the authority to put anyone on the cross. It was the Romans, right? Pay attention, guys. Who crucified Jesus? The Romans. So here it says, they slew him not, nor crucified him. Wait a second. Show me one Jew in the whole history of Jews who cruci crucified people. It was a Roman punishment, right, guys? The Romans were the ones who were, did the crucifixion. Yeah, exactly, Andrew Martin. So you see, Allah, or in this case, Muhammad, we know it's Muhammad. He is lying about the Jews and he is lying again for the second time about the Jews. The Jews never crucified Jesus. Jews went to the Romans, right? They went to the Romans because they wanted Jesus to be crucified. But the Jews never crucified anyone. And problem number three it says they slew him not, they killed him not, and not nor crucified him. Question. Question to the audience. Question to the audience. When, let's say, the Romans here killed people, right? They put them on the cross. Question. Did the Romans first kill people? Did they first kill people and then crucify them? Or did they crucify people and because it's really a horrendous suffering, then they died? Do you understand what I'm asking, guys? So according to this ayah, people died and when they died, then they crucified them. Did you, do you see the problem? They killed him not. Sorry, they killed him not. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا صَلَبُهُ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ They killed him not, and they did not crucify him. Oh, CP is on? Okay. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's teaching. I don't want to be much longer here, because I respect our brother in Christ, Christian Prince. So go to him, go enjoy his teaching. Thank you for watching, guys. God bless you. Thank you for supporting our work. See you next time. God bless. Jesus is Lord and Islam is nothing but a fake satanic cult. See you next time, guys. God bless.